So, so last summer, uh, when we were meeting out here for outdoor services and beginning to think that the shutdown was uh, going to end, <laughs> what a joke, right? We thought the shutdown was going to end and we're going to move back inside and what's church going to be like? We're just going to go back to normal? Uh, I, I began praying uh, through that time and, and the Lord... Uh, the Lord started working in my heart because I, I, I wrote down like all the things we stopped doing and I filled up a piece of paper with four columns of things that we did weekly or monthly or even annually and like all these things that we did and praying through like, Lord, what, what do we need to stop doing that we are doing? What do we need to start doing that we aren't doing? And Lord, what's something we are doing that needs a greater focus and, and attention? Because I was just not convinced that God was calling us to just go right back to what we were doing, but calling us to something greater. And I wanted to be an obedient pastor, not a comfortable pastor. So I met with Pastor Mike and Pastor Micah and, and asked them this question, like, in what areas of Scripture is the church called to be fruitful? Like, right? What, what does the Scripture say about the church? Because, like, the, the Scriptures don't tell the church you have to have Sunday school. Like, I know that might be a surprise to some people, but uh, there's nothing about Sunday school in the Scriptures, but there is discipleship. And there's nothing about life groups, but there is about biblical community. And so instead of looking at the, the activities of our church, it was more like, well, what does the Bible say that a church, these areas that a church should be fruitful in? And we came up with, with 10 different areas in that meeting. We were just going through scriptures and praying through and, and 10 different areas. And then I said, okay, so these, if these are the 10 areas that God calls us as a church to be fruitful, how fruitful are we in these areas? So we, we honestly just stepped back. And put a score between 1 to 10 in each of these 10 areas. And, and honestly, as we, we, as we sat back and looked at it, we're like, ah, our church, we certainly have room to grow in every one of these areas. But that left me wondering, like, if we have all these activities that we do, why do all these activities not translate into just a biblically fruitful, growing, thriving church? And I think it's very important for us as we return to activity— not to be in such a rush to get into activity so that we're busy again, but so that we're accomplishing what the Lord has asked the church to be. Because again, I'd rather be obedient than comfortable. I'd rather be biblical than comfortable. And so together with Pastor Mike and Pastor Micah, we're going to take the next couple of weeks and go through these 10 of what a biblical church from the Word of God looks like. And Pastor Mike's going to preach next week, and Pastor Micah the week after that. And we're just going to open up the Word of God and say, what does God say about, a, about what a church should look like? And, and we're coming prayerfully saying, not, well, this is what Mount Carmel is, but rather, God, what do you want Mount Carmel to be? Because it's your church. Okay. So today, I'm just going to lay an introduction for this series of a biblical church. And today, I'm just going to share with you uh, three different areas, and I'm, I'm not connected, Trent. I'm sorry. I'm not connected. Nope. So we're just going to look at three different areas today. We're going to look at the description of the church, like what is the church? The purpose of the church, why is the church? And the motivation, like how does the church accomplish what Christ wants us to accomplish? And here's why this is important. A wrong view of the church— will lead to failed expectations of the church. We have the wrong view of what the church should be. We will be failed by what the church is. And, 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 and wrong expectations lead the church either to enter into, well, presenting a false gospel so we can get people to come, even though it's not a true gospel, which is where the prosperity gospel comes from, or, or we become a, a dead church. Because we're no longer that body that God has called us to be. And just look at the book of Revelation. There's seven churches laid out there, and you can see, you can see how that already plays out. But so, so we'll start with this question. Like, what is, the, what is the description of the church? Now, if you were to ask the average Christian to describe their church, you'll hear words like, well, it's welcoming, or it's authentic, it's got great music, or it's inspiring, and, 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 I, and I love getting to be there. It's dynamic. Or, or you, might, <laughs> you might hear the exact opposite. My church is boring, and it is dull, and especially that preacher. Uh, that guy, he's got, he's got all kinds of problems, and, and it's unfriendly. But see, none of those words actually describe the church. They describe how the church makes you feel. 
But how the church makes us feel is often the determining factor in what church we choose to attend. How do I feel? Do I feel comfortable because people are similar to me? Do I feel accepted because people are friendly to me? Do do my kids feel happy because they have a a fun time? Do I feel comfortable singing old hymns or or do I want the newer worship songs? And, And please don't get me wrong. It is not wrong to want to feel accepted and happy and comfortable when you go to church. I mean, it's like a family, right? It's supposed to be like a family. But as we said, a wrong view of the church is going to lead us to all kinds of failed expectations of the church. See, if if I come to church on Sunday morning and and my view of the church is that the church is supposed to make me feel good, but they fail. Church, and, and, and I'm supposed to feel comfortable, but then I don't. I leave upset. If I walk into church expecting the pastor, the, the song leader, the worship leader to, to fill my spirit, but then I, they don't, then I leave empty. Wrong view of the church leading to failed expectations. And so if my, my view of the church is wrong, my expectations of what to receive from the church will be wrong. And like, so, so what is a wrong view of the church? Well, one wrong view of the church is that the church is a building. Like the church is, it's a building and it's a place to to go. And and when you view the church as a building or view the church as a place to go, it will lead to a failed expectation of consumerism. Like when we go shopping, right? We we choose the places we go to. We choose the stores we go to based on what? Well, they have what we want for the prices that we like. And if one place doesn't have what I want as the consumer, well, I can choose to go to another place and I go based on what I get out of it and what's in it for me. And this is the view that many Christians have today of, of churches, and even very good Christians. This church has great doctrine, but I don't really like the singing, so I'm going to find a style where I fit in a little bit. Small groups with fellowship, but you know what? I'd rather be part of a larger congregation where I'll, I'll feel like I fit in better. And when we view the church as a building or as a, as a place we become consumers, and, and if that church doesn't have what I want, I'll go to that church. And it's one reason why you'll find in some communities, you'll find three Baptist churches on one street corner. It's crazy. It's why church splits take place because, well, this church doesn't have what I want, so I'm going to either start a new church or find a new church that, that will. And, and, and it's, it, it's like the wrong view of church leads to these failed expectations. And, and so... Imogen, she's over there. Imogen's looking for you. There you go. <laughs> it's like the guy that was marooned on a desert island. You hear about him? He, uh, he, was saved after, he was saved after five years on a desert island. Oh, he was so excited. He gets, starts making his way to the rescue boat, and the, the people were, were just like just astounded that this guy had lived for five years on his own. And he gets in the boat, and, and they're looking at the island, and they notice three huts. And they're like, so like, I thought you were here alone. And he's like, I was. Well, what are the three huts? Well, like the first one is my house. The second one is my church. Well, what's the third one? Well, that's the church I used to go to. Right? That's, <laughs> that's the idea we have of a, of, a, of a failed expectation of the church. Another wrong view of the church is that it's, it's a business or it's an institution. Like it's, it just, it's in it for the business end. And, and viewing the church as a business is going to lead to the failed expectation of comparison see this church is better than that church this church has this program and it's better than than that church that has that program this was this results and it's crazy but it results in churches in the same town or the same city like competing for the same christians like that doesn't make any sense whatsoever we have communities filled with unsaved people that churches should be reaching out to and yet we're competing over a few already saved individuals and the world has millions and billions of people those are the people that need the church to reach out to them but a and a wrong view of the church can lead to failed expectations so if we know the church is not a building and christians are not consumers and the church is not a business and we're not in competition then what is the definition of the church and that's where we, what we find in the book of ephesians if you look at chapter number one of ephesians Chapter, or chapter number one of Ephesians. I'm going to look at the last two verses of chapter number one, verses 22 and 23. Ephesians chapter one, verses 22 
and 23. This is what the word of God says. And he, God, put all things under his, Jesus' feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church is not a building. The church is not a business. The church is a body. It's the body of Christ. And Paul will say that in chapter 3. He'll say that three times in chapter 4. He'll say it two times in chapter 5. The church is a body, not a building, not a, not a business. We're not consumers. We're not competitors. We, as a body, are a community. How is a body a community? How is a body a community? Well, Paul talks about this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 when he starts talking about the hands and the feet and the, the ears and the eyes, and he talks about all these different members that find union in one body. So Paul's going to teach in Ephesians chapter 1 and, and really all throughout Ephesians is different members that come together to comprise one individual singular body and, and in ephesians chapter number one paul is primarily going to talk about two members that come together and, and this is not what everybody understands so i'm going to take just a moment to, to explain it paul's going to talk about the jew and the gentile coming together and i know you might be thinking like what is a jew what is a gentile jews were the chosen people of god all throughout the old testament descendants of abraham gentiles everyone else in the world if you were not in the lineage of Abraham, a Jew, you were considered a Gentile. Here's what I want you to see in chapter number one, and I don't have this for you to read, so this is where I would love for you to have your Bibles open or your devices open. And, and let's look at Ephesians chapter number one as Paul starts off this chapter. I'm going to read the first two verses, and then, then I'm just going to skip through, but, but again, I don't have the verses with me. I'd love for you to follow along. It's chapter one, verse one. It says, Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 3. From here on, I'm just going to skip. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ. Notice that pronoun, us. Look at verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless. Verse 5, for he predestined us for adoption. Verse number 6, to the praise of his glorious grace with, with, with which he has blessed us. Verse 7, in him we have redemption for the, through the blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Verse 8, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. And now I have verse 11 up on the board in case you don't have, uh, in case you don't have the scriptures. Verse 11, he's going to come to a close in these two verses and talking about we and us. He's going to say, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of of his glory we us we us we we us we us we us to the praise of his glory what paul what paul was a jew jews were chosen by god before the foundation of the world to be used as a vessel to bring the savior to the world they were called to be his people adopted into his, into his sonship and paul's saying this is what we have and all of that is for his glory ultimately but he changes his tune completely in verse number 13. Look at verse 13. In him, you. Now he's talking to the church of Ephesus. He's talking to those Gentiles outside the family of God, the Jews. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believe in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee. Ha, here, check this out. Who is the guarantee of our, whoo, right up to this point, every time Paul was saying we and us, he's talking about the Jews. Then he introduces the Gentiles as you have your gospel. And now he says, who is the guarantee of our Jew and Gentile together, our inheritance until we Jew and Gentile acquire possession of it. Why? To the praise of his glory. Ha. Jews were called to the praise of his glory. Gentiles were brought into the body of Christ for the praise of his glory. And here's the thing that Paul's saying. It's not just for the Jews. It's for the Gentiles. The body of Christ is where it's not two bodies. It is one body where all different members come together, finding unity in, the, in Christ, in his body. 
Okay. Why? Great question. So glad you asked. Look at chapter 2. See, this is the unity we find in, in the second chapter of Ephesians. And again, I don't have these verses, so you're going to have to follow along on your own. We're going to read almost the entire chapter. Chapter 2. And I want you to notice verses 1 through 10 are all about my unity with God through Christ. My unity with God through Christ. Look at verse, chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and, and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the age, coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk walk in them. Paul is rejoicing in redemption. We sinners have been, we dead have been given life and been unified with God the Father. Ha, amen. But he doesn't stop there. Now he says, now that you have been unified with God, here's what needs to happen. Let's keep reading verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, meaning like they were the Gentiles, they weren't circumcised like the Jews were, by what is called the circumcision, the Jews, which is made flesh in by, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, alienated from the Jews, from the nation of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you once who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us, Jew and Gentile, both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and expressing ordinances that the Jews kept, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, one structure, being joined together, grows into a, not two, but into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You know what this chapter tells us? That your personal relationship with Christ that is talked about in the first half of Ephesians 2 is never meant to stay personal. Your personal relationship with Christ is meant to go is, is, is meant to go out and to be interwoven with others who have a personal relationship with Christ so that my relationship with Christ draws me into union with you who have a relationship with Christ because we are not no longer two. We are one body. And, and as, as this banner over here talks about we are members of the same household we are one family we're under the same banner of heaven we're one temple awaiting the dwelling place of god Whew. people who naturally reject one another jew and gentile unified people who hated one another jew and samaritan brought together by the cross one body the definition of a church a unified body of baptized believers who exists for the praise of God's glory. Chapter 3 of Ephesians. We won't get there today, but I'll read these verses. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. The church exists for the praise of God's glory as a unified body of baptized believers. But... As much as we read, it doesn't tell us how. How is God glorified? What's the purpose? 
behind the church. So let's look at that, the purpose of the church. Well, we already know that the church exists for God's glory. So how is God glorified? And here, here's, what I would, here's what I would share with you. And again, this isn't like, like the only answer, but I feel like it's a very complete answer. God is glorified when the body of Christ takes on the appearance of Jesus. So here's the thing. In the Bible, there's only one thing ever described as the glory of God. Actually, it's not one thing described as the glory of God. One person is described as the glory of God. Jesus Christ himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, and 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Both say the same thing. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the glory of God is Jesus. The church is the body of Jesus. So when the church looks, acts, and appears like Jesus, God's glory is on display. What, is the, what does that mean, though, for the church to look and to act like Jesus? Well, we have the Gospels. Like, right, we see, we see exactly how Jesus acted. We see exactly what Jesus did when he was on the earth in human form. And here's what we find. A humble, loving, forgiving healing, holy, committed, caring, teaching, sacrificial man who spent his life making disciples, never backing down from truth, submissive to the will of his father, and who was willing to lay down his life for his enemies. And here's what I'll promise you. If the church looked like that, God would get great glory problem is in the church we often bicker over the color of the carpet i don't i don't see that in christ's life i i just i just struggle with with was a church we, we make we make things that, that go on the wall more important than the mission that we're called to i love but i love what mark dev he said this about the church we cannot demonstrate love, joy, patience, and the other fruits of the Spirit when sitting alone by ourselves on an island. Demonstrate it when we have reasons not to love someone, but we do anyways. When we have a reason not to show forgiveness, but we do. That is a purpose of the church giving God an opportunity to receive glory from people who do what they should never do. I remember sitting in a premarital counseling once and I, and I use, a, use a book that talks about Jesus being the center of everything. We're talking about Jesus being the center of love, that he is the, he is the one who, who is the, not just the example of our love, but we have to look at his love. And, and so I, I turned, the, to the, turned to the man and asked him a question. It wasn't meant to be a trick question, but like he was a little afraid to answer. He's like, uh, I said, so when is it hard to love her? That's a trick question. I don't know where you're going with that one. Like, come on. What do you mean, when is it hard to love her? And he was thinking. And I said, well, when is it hard to love her? And finally, he was like, I just love her all the time. <laughs> and I did. I, I chuckled. And I'm like, come on. I, I know it's not always easy to love. So I finally I looked at her. And I'm like, when is it easiest to love him? And she said, well, that's easy. When he makes me. Yeah. That's exactly right. It's so easy to love someone when they make you happy. But that is not the love that Jesus Christ gave us an example. His love was love your enemies. His love was lay your life down for those who are going to be crucifying you. His love was to wash the feet of the disciples who would use those feet to run away from him. That is the love that Jesus showed us. And that is even the love Jesus calls us to in John chapter 13. When he said to his disciples, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as as I have loved you. God's glory was on display in, the Christ, in Christ's love. God's glory wants to be displayed in the church's love, which is to be the same love as Christ. As the love of Christ and every other fruit of the Spirit is lived out in our lives, the world looks on and God is glorified. I recently heard a pastor talking about how he was sharing a need for the mission with uh, for the mission field with his church. He didn't tell them ahead of time. It was a need that kind of came at the last minute. He stood in front of his church and he said, "Church, we have a, a way to help a need to reach to have the gospel reach the far ends of the earth." And he they took up an offering just on the spot. Thousands and thousands of dollars were given. A man came up to him after the service and said, "Pastor, I wanted to give in that offering, but." I don't have any money. 
I used, to be a well, I used to be well off, but I'm not anymore. So I have something I'd like to give you. Would you take my Rolex? Took off his Rolex and handed it to the pastor, and he said, I want this to be used for the glory of God to reach the nations. The pastor in the next service stood up holding with that holding that Rolex in his hand and he talked about the sacrifices that need to be made for the glory of God to reach the ends of the nation. And, and people were so moved again. Money was given. But there was a couple that came up to the pastor afterwards and said, Pastor, we were so moved by that man that gave the Rolex. We, we want to give the amount of money that Rolex is for, it would cost, and we want to return that watch to that man. The pastor and that couple went over to that man's house and, and brought back the watch to him. And he wept because he said, I had always wanted to give that watch to my son when he graduated from college. But the glory of God reaching the nations was more important than that. But look at what God did. In that same offering, a lady took off some gold earrings and she wrote a note with it when it was slipped into the, into the offering plate. And she said, these gold earrings were given to me by my mother, but my mother does not know the Lord. I am going to pray that these gold earrings can be used so that the gospel can reach someone else's mother who does not know the Lord. That's the glory of God on display. That's people living like Jesus has called us to live. But, but he doesn't just not call us to, to, to love one another, but he calls us to make disciples. You say, what does discipleship have to do with God's glory? Everything, right? Think of the glory that is given to God when lives are changed, when dead become alive. Lives are changed through the gospel of Christ. And then those changed lives are welcomed into a people that they're nothing like, but they are embraced with love and generosity by that people. Oh, that is God's glory on display. And that's what we as a church are called to do body of baptized believers who exist for the praise of God's glory by being and making disciples who have the appearance of Christ. Yeah, but how do you do that? Yeah, that's, that's a tall order. Jesus is Jesus, but Jesus is God. Like, I, I'm, I, I know I might be part of the body of Christ, but you got to know I'm a sinner. I'm far from anything like that. Well, then what is the motivation of the church? How does the church do what we are called to do? You got your Bibles open, look back to Ephesians chapter 1, and we're almost done. Verse 15. How? 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 Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. The Bible says this, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And take note of this. Take note of this. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. So we want you to see. See this with your heart. That you may know. What I need, what I need to know? That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And what is the immeasurable Greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come. Jesus has been given all power, all rule, all authority by God. And what does Jesus do with all that power? What does he do with all that authority? I mean, he could accomplish anything. God raised him from the dead. That, that, that kind of power. <laughs> what does Jesus do with all that? He fills his body with it. He fills his church with it. Because look at the last two verses. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Huh. That means every power, all the strength, all the might that has been given to Jesus by God. 
It's here in the church His body What that means Anything we're called to do We can accomplish Through his power And through his authority Struggle is We just don't believe it That's why we won't have the conversations With people we're called to have conversations with About Jesus If I were timid you don't know the will, we're filled with the power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead that we celebrated last Sunday on a resurrection Sunday. That power is in the church. You are the church. You have his power. We just don't recognize it. I've told you this story before, but remember a young man who was who was an orphan and he was adopted into a family and, and before, just after a few days of living with his new family, the, the mom found some bits of food stuffed between the, the bed rail and the, and the mattress and she found treats and toys that they have given him hidden under his clothes and his drawers and, and she was talking to her husband about it, not really understanding and her husband began to cry and she said, this is what the orphanage said would happen. He's been adopted into our family. He's now our son but he still lives like an orphan. So that man, when he got home, he, he took his kid all around the house and said, you see that, you see that, you see that, you see that, you see that? It's yours, because you're my son. They stood outside the house and stood on the sidewalk and he said, you see everything there, everything there. That is yours. You don't have to hide. It is yours because you are my son. Hey, you know, God says, hey, hey, everything that is Jesus, Jesus has given to you. You have life raising power as a church but we argue over things that just don't matter because we believe the church is a building and we're consumers which is a business and we're competitors but oh the church is a is a body and we are a community a community that is dedicated to god and to the praise of his glory and we are a community that cares for one another so what? Well, this series, these next couple weeks, my prayer is that you would see a biblical view of the church. Not your view of the church, not your personal view of the church, but a, but a biblical view of the church. And I would ask, would you pray with me that we would be an obedient church, not a comfortable church? But also, I, I would ask you, is there, is there anybody in the body with whom you lack unity? I mean, Christ brought us to the Father so that we have unity with the Father. And how strange is it that someone else who has the same unity with the same Father, we don't have unity together with? That doesn't bring glory to God. Now, there's, there's anyone in the church that, that to whom you're not reconciled or to whom you don't have unity, man, please get that right. Are the attributes of Christ on display in your life for the glory of God? Are you living? Not just here at the church, because I mean, we open up these doors, we look really nice inside of here, but you understand, if you are the church and you go home inside of your home, you are still the body of Christ in the church. So how do you act at home? And do you truly believe God's power rests on you? What would you do if you knew you wouldn't fail for Christ? What would you do? Man, that's what he asks us to do, right? I don't know who wrote this, but I'm just going to read this to you in closing. Someone said, because I am the church, my church will be friendly if I am. My church will do a great work if I work. My church will make generous gifts to many causes if I am generous. My church will bring others into its fellowship if I bring them. The seats of my church will be filled if I fill them. My church will be a church of love and forgiveness, sacrifice and generosity, confidence and power if I am filled with these. Since I am the church, I will become what I want my church to become. Since I am the church, I will become what I want my church to become. We don't do it so the church gets glory. Church receives glory to give to God, and we receive glory by looking like Jesus, who is the glory of God.
So just, just, to, just maybe as, a, as an extra help to you as we go through this series again, it'll be a couple weeks and Pastor Michael will kick us off next week, but I, I purchased a number of books called I Am a Church Member. And for, for many of you, it'll just be like, oh yeah, I, I, I know these things, you know, I, I, it's a good reminder, but, but maybe for some of you, you didn't really understand what a church, a church member is not like being the member of a country club. Country club, you get things. Church member, you get to give things to one another. And th- th- there's, there's books on the back table as you leave. There's books on the two tables outside the front, outside these entry doors. Take one per family on your way out. And it's just a real small, thin book. So Chris Hopkins, you could probably get through that one. Uh, anyways, but it's real small, it's real thin. You, I'd just be an encouragement to you, I believe. Would you pray with me?